there's always so much more to see. So I'm just, um, we're also pleased that the show has been as uh, popular and successful as we'd hoped. And of course, it's another excuse to uh, bring back our guest speaker, um, someone who I think will really offer some interesting insight, and I'm going to give him just his brief introduction. He says I don't need to give him a real introduction, but I feel like it's incumbent upon me. We would, you know, we've known each other for a long time. We actually met each other at the Kimball Art Museum. We had the good fortune of working on an exhibition together um, on Stubbs uh, and the Horse, which turned out to be a very popular exhibition as well. Uh, we had miscalculated that Maryland is actually thoroughbred country. Uh, stupid not to realize that, but in any case, uh, sometimes these things work out fortuitously. Um, but uh, here, I'll just read a little bit. Um, Malcolm uh, Warner, he's now an independent art historian. Um, that's what we designate people who've decided to retire. Um, and he has recently retired from his executive position as director at the Laguna Art Museum. Um, so now he's got the luxury of doing what we all dream of doing, which is sitting around doing whatever scholarship you choose. And his first obsession has always been the art of John Everett Millet. And that was the topic of his dissertation at the Croutold. So that's what he's doing. Catalog Raisonné going to appear, we hope, at some point. We've all been waiting for it. And um, really, we know him, though, as a seasoned curator whose most famous exhibition may have been the Pre-Raphaelites, which was held at the Tate back in 1984 and in which Millet also featured. He's also spent the better part of his museum career here in the States. Um, he was curator of European art at the San Diego Museum of Art, senior curator of paintings and sculpture at the Yale Center for British Art, senior curator and deputy director at the Kimball Art Museum, and um, then finally at Laguna. Among the international loan exhibitions he's curated or co-curated were uh, the Victorians, British painting 1837 to 1901, which was held at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, uh, Millet portraits, National Portrait Gallery in 1999, Stubbs and the Horse that I mentioned, and The Mirror and the Mask, Portraiture in the Age of Picasso, uh, which was a collaborative exhibition between the Kimball and the Museo Tissin Bornemitsa. So today, he's gonna talk to us about the artist who's featured in our temporary exhibition upstairs uh, in a lecture entitled Van Gogh, the Anglophile, Looking Through His Eyes at Victorian Art. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ike, for that nice introduction. And uh, congratulations on the exhibition, which is very beautiful. And thank you for uh, showing up in this unseasonable weather that we're having. Um, for... Um, Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so through the eyes of uh, people from the continent of Europe, uh, London has always had uh, a special appeal and a special uh, distinctiveness. There's always um, something special about the way they've responded to London. Um, maybe it's having to cross the channel to get there. Um, the image of London in the 18th century um, if you look at the art and literature in which London appears, especially south of the Channel amongst the, the Europeans, the image is positive. Um, Britain at the time was uh, an increasingly powerful and prosperous country, and it was associated with sort of openness and, and culture. Um, if you look at what Voltaire, the great French philosopher, said about London at this time, it's incredibly uh, laudatory. Um, he saw it as a place that was politically free and enlightened, almost like it was the, the capital of the Enlightenment. Um, it was a bit of a cliche, in fact, to describe London as the new Rome. Um, and you see that in a, a, a mid-18th century painting like the one on the screen now. Here's an Italian artist uh, painting London and kind of making it look um, almost, almost Roman. Um, the 
the, the dome and the, uh, of St. Paul's is right in the center there. He's invented this uh, fanciful architecture, which presumably was on a, on a bridge over the Thames. And then to either side, um, I don't know if you can make them out, but they're, Ro they're statues of Romans looking astonished at the rise of this uh, rival empire to ancient Rome uh, that's come up in the north of Europe, London. Um, whether the, it truly looked as, as clean and open and fresh as it looks in a painting like this, I doubt. You know, London was, was swathed in fog most of the time. Uh, but uh, visiting foreign artists, as if they're trying to show it as a, a city of the Enlightenment, they make it look light and airy and open. Now, by 1872, when um, the year before Van Gogh shows up in London, uh, the city has a very different kind of image. Here we see St. Paul's, it's up, there. you hardly see it actually, it's up there at the top. Now it's become swamped um, in um, a mass of kind of uh, tra traffic, um, hum uh, a sort of s uh, seething mass of humanity. Um, driving back and forth up Ludgate Hill in front of the, the cathedral there. There's pollution, you know, and uh, the artist of this, Gustave Doré, points that up by, you know, just at this moment, there's a train going across the bridge here, belching black sm smoke out. Um, we've gone kind of from color to black and white in our image of London here. And the cliche about it changed too, because at this point in the, to, middle to late 19th century, the cliche becomes the new Babylon. It's no longer the new Rome, it's the new Babylon, this, this whorish city of sin and abominations. Uh, and that's the way it comes across in, um, in Doré's uh, famous book, London, A Pilgrimage, which you see two more images from here. When, um, when foreigners look at a place uh, like Yo, Antonio Yoli and uh, Dore are doing here in Van Gogh too. They, they see it in a special way, unlike the way um, native people look at it, the people who actually live there and know it on a daily basis. Uh, the visitor is prone to kind of errors and misinterpretations and exaggerations, but they're, they're especially attuned to what makes the city that they're looking at distinctive, what makes London, London. Um, Gustave Doré used this title, London, a pilgrimage, in a very uh, ironic way, of course. It's hard to imagine um, a coffee table book like he was producing here that was about London or anywhere else today uh, that would show so the dark side <laughs> with such vividness like this. Uh, not that it's all dark in the Doré. It's, uh, he does show some scenes of leisure and pleasure too. But it, certainly for Van Gogh and for, for most of us who know this book, the, um, the most striking and memorable images for, from it are ones like these of uh, this scene on the s poor people in the street and the East End and um, a, pr a prison exercise yard here. So nowadays, you might think of London as the city of the, of the past. You know, most people who visit are interested in history, uh, associations with the royal family and so on. But in Van Gogh's time, uh, he was coming to the city of the present, you know, where um, somehow you, you got to see uh, all the darkness and the suffering that had been brought on by the industrial age in, in, in its most essential and vivid form. Um, Van Gogh knew uh, Gustave Doré's book very well, and when he was in the asylum at Saint-Rémy, at the very end of his life, he had a, a print of the, of the Doré, the, the work on the left there, and this is his painting based on it, where this central figure here uh, is starting to look like a, a self-portrait. You know, the, the middle figure in the Doré starts to become a little bit transformed in Van Gogh's imagination into himself. Uh, he certainly felt like he was in a prison in, um, Saint-Rémy. Wonderful touch about this paint, the print and the painting actually. There are a couple of butterflies flying around up here. 
as if to um, just suggest the the other side of life, you know, freedom and um, escape, maybe. Which just goes to um, to point up how miserable uh, the human element here is. Uh, he's using color here uh, to um, emphasize the feeling about the, the, the dismal state of these men, predominantly blue at the bottom, getting warmer and, and lighter at the top, as if, um, you know, like the butterflies, to suggest uh, the alternative to, to the, the blue situation of being in jail. Anyway, that's, that's jumping to the, hen- to the end of Van Gogh's story. I want to come back now to his arrival as a young man in London. So he, uh, he spent some formative years there. He was there from 1873 to 1876, uh, between the ages of 20 and 23. Um, he went back and forth a little bit to The Hague and um, to Paris during that time. But over those years, he spent a, a total of um, 31 months living, uh, in Lo- living and working in London. He'd been sent there by the art dealer Goupil, who he'd started working for in The Hague, in the Netherlands, Uh, they transferred him to the London branch. They were a a print publisher and dealer. Um, And it's through working for them, remember he hasn't become an artist this time, but he's a great lover of art. He he becomes a lover specifically of prints, um, reproductive prints that show famous paintings, but also uh, independent works and... and, um, uh, illustrations too, and we'll see plenty of those as we go through the things that excited him about what he saw in Britain. Um, he fell in love with British art, really, and you, you know that that quote there um, sums it up. He found the noblest and the highest expressions of art in in the British. He said, "This is a a quote from one of the famous letters to his brother Theo." Um, so he went, um, he went to see a lot of art there. Uh, he uh, regularly attended the Royal Academy Exhibition, which was the big annual show uh, where all the contemporary artists in Britain would um, um, bring before the public their, their latest works. The sensation of the 1874 Royal Academy show, which uh, Van Gogh attended, was this work by Luke Files, Applicants for Admission to a Casual Ward. Um, now, there were different, um, and to some extent, opposing currents within British art at this time, which you could see on the walls of the Royal Academy's exhibition. Um, at the opposite extreme to this, there was the aesthetic movement in which um, artists um, set the priority on beauty. Uh, They were escapists, basically. Uh, Their response to the the grime and the pollution and the the discomforts of the industrial age was to escape to a mythic world from from, um, ancient Greece and Rome, you know, the the myths. uh, The Arthurian legends were very popular with them. Um, That was one type of painting that you could see at the Royal Academy. There there were rural idylls too, landscape paintings that were a a celebration of a kind of pre-industrial idealized England. But then amid much controversy, uh, this kind of thing starts to pop up. Uh, That uh, social realism. Um, Paintings like this called upon the the viewer to um, experience a compassion for the victims of the the modern world. And they've struck a deep chord with Van Gogh and played a big part in shaping his view of the role of art. Um, What's happening here is that these these miserable looking people are queuing up um, outside um, basically a homeless shelter but you, you had to work there to earn your keep. It was a workhouse, uh, a ca- and you could, a, it's a casual ward because um, you weren't gonna live there, it was just for the night. And we see um, uh, a soldier with, with um, a crutch here, he's been injured, a, a disabled boy, um, a, a single mother here with a child and a drunkard, 
it goes on and on. <laughs> There's, it's a, like a, an anthology of the worst things that you, you could see amongst the street people of London. It was based on an illustration that the same artist, Luke Fildes, had done in a magazine in 1869. And this is, this is the illustration. It was for the, the graphic. And you see a, a, a typical cover of the graphic there in the upper left. Um, the graphic was a new uh, weekly news, newspaper that was um, uh, that was the, ri the first rival, really, to the famous Illustrated London News, which had been going for a, for a few years. And those two papers uh, really mark the, 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 the beginning of illustrated journalism in, um, in Britain. You know, there had been newspapers for years, but uh, the technology suddenly allowed for uh, lots of pictures to be in the, in the newspapers, um, and the, the graphic was a, a pioneer in that. Um, and the illustrations aren't all grim, um, like the, the, the one on the left there, it's actually a, a, the, the cover showing um, military men experimenting with a balloon, you know, uh, that, that, that they're going to use. But um, the, again, the most memorable and the most striking images, certainly for Van Gogh, were the, were the grim ones. Um, and indeed, that, would, that had been the same for Gustave Doré, I'm sure that his book, London, A Pilgrimage, which came out a couple of years after this illustration, uh, was influenced by the scenes like this by uh, Files and other graphic artists um, of the time. They were done in wood engraving. Uh, it's a printing process that's uh, it's a relief process where you, you cut away the, surf the printing surface where it's to print white, and the raised bits uh, are what print. Um, you know, uh, what get inked. Um, it's, it's basically the same as, as a woodcut that you might be more s familiar with. Uh, but th the innovation here was that they used the end grain of boxwood, which is a very dense and tough material. Um, and uh, hence, and used the, yeah, the end grain, um, which made their, their printing surface much more durable than any woodcut would ever have been. So, that, and that, that I, I mention this because it does explain the proliferation of these images. Um, you know, they really were churned out in vast numbers because they were able to do that because of uh, the innovation of wood engraving. Um, and actually, Van Gogh, we know, preferred this illustration, which was the basis of the big painting, uh, to the painting itself. And I, I think there are good reasons for that. He liked black and white at this stage. You know, I know he becomes associated with a burst of color, but um, uh, in the phase of his career that we're looking at now, uh, where before he's even become an artist, but into his early career, he's in love with the, the effect that you can get from black and white. It's almost symbolic, really, of um, his black and white view of the world as, as being, um, you know, um, uh, and, his, and his, his attraction to scenes that in, inspire pity for... Um, the poor and the suffering. Uh, it's also uh, a more compressed composition than a painting, which I think he responded to as well. And of course, as a print, it's more uh, democratic. Uh, a painting is a one-off that doesn't necessarily reach a lot of people. They have to make the effort to go to the Royal Academy exhibition, and then the painting might disappear into a private collection, whereas prints, and Van Gogh loved this idea, were a democratic um, artistic medium. They reached a, a wide audience because they were cheap and plentiful. So Van Gogh loved the graphic. Um, we know that when he was in London, he made a point of, of walking to the offices of the Illustrated London News and the graphic in the city of London where they, they had display windows where they would show the latest uh, editions so he could see see what, was, what had just come out. Um, he was that keen. And back in the Netherlands in 1883, after his London period, he, he bought a whole run of um, uh, issues of the graphic, you know, volumes, volumes from 1869 to 1880. Uh, it was a real splurge for him because he was poverty-stricken at the time. 
but he, he so much wanted to have these prints with him that he, he made this sacrifice and referred to them as a kind of Bible, you know, like uh, a, a font of visual wisdom, uh, actually. So in 1883, at the time he's um, making this drawing and he's just bought the, the run of the graphic, he's living in The Hague and he, um, he meets this lady, uh, Sian Hornick, at a, at a soup kitchen. Um, just the sort of subject that he was attracted to under the inspiration of works like the, the one on the left there from, you know, it's uh, poor people, charity. Um, this, and this, so this is Sian, um, her daughter here. She was a, a prostitute and a single mother. And then this is her um, sister. And on the left, her mother, with the child that Van Gogh and Sien had together, Willem. But note the technique of the drawing, the, the um, emphasis on a lot of parallel lines called hatching, uh, which picks up uh, the look of wood engraving, actually. It's as if Van Gogh was a little bit trying to imitate the, the, not just the general composition and the subject matter, but even the, the texture, the linear texture of uh, wood engraved illustrations. And the same goes sort of for the paintings that he did after returning from his London trip and becoming an artist in The Hague. He did a series of um, heads of peasants like the work on the right here. Um, overall quite dark um, in a way that you know links them with the uh, the, the graphic illustrations, um, emphasis on light, dark contrasts. Really, if you imagine the work on the right just as a black and white photograph, it, it wouldn't really lose much uh, because it's so deeply rooted in black and white work, I think. Um, the illustration on the left, which appeared in the, the graphic, um, was among the, the, the works that uh, Van Gogh therefore collected uh, was especially meaningful for him because he, he, um, you know, when in London and also immediately after returning to the Low Countries, he he did aspire to being a preacher before he became an artist, and he'd spent time as a as a lay preacher, bringing his kind of missionary zeal to this area of Belgium called the Borinage, which was an industrialized mining community. So he, he had this great special feeling always for working class people, but especially for miners. So he loved this, um, this example from a series they did in the graphic called uh, Heads of the People. Um, and um, his own Heads of the People, you know, the, he did a series of works like the one we just saw on the right, fed into his first great masterpiece, the, great, the famous uh, The Potato Eaters of 1885 here. Um, potatoes, remember, were a staple of poor people's diet. Um, hence the, the tragedy of the Irish um, potato famine. It wasn't just that they, they couldn't get potatoes, <laughs> uh, but they could eat something else. There, there wasn't much else. And um, uh, so Van Gogh is really drawing attention here to the extreme like simplicity and down-to-earthness, almost literally, of the, the, the peasant, the life of um, peasants. And it seems to me it's the work in which he first found this perfect synchronicity between style and subject matter. Uh, what I mean to say is that the, the color and the, the technique uh, perfectly unite with the, the subject and vice versa too. So that um, qualities like roughness and honesty and simplicity are qualities not just of the, the people depicted, but of the painting it, itself. It's as if the people are, are made of earth, like they've grown out of the earth because they because of the, the, the colors that he used, just like potatoes, you know, that they um, And then, of course, he followed it up with a lithograph, um, again, out of his um, uh, enthusiasm for the idea of the print as a democratic medium, uh, imitating what he'd seen from the, the graphic.
Well, on the literary side, Van Gogh's favorite British author was Charles Dickens. Um, he was very fond, by the way, of a story that, that he'd heard about Dickens um, relying on the advice of the great British artist Millet, who um, you know, I have a special interest in, uh, who I'm going to talk about more in a minute. But anyway, Dickens uh, was advised by Millet about a choice of illustrator for his latest novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And Millet recommended the painter of the, um, you know, the homeless and hungry illustration in the ga graphic and the, uh, the painting, uh, the admission to the applicants for admission to the casual world, Luke Files. Uh, Millet had seen his work at the Royal Academy and loved, loved it and recommended Files to do uh, illustrations, including this one on the left, for The Mystery of Edwin Drood, um, Dickens's last novel, as it turned out. Um, when Dickens died in 1870, the graphic sent Luke Files to his house in Kent, Gads Hill, to... Um, produced this image of, of his working studio, I suppose you'd say. Van Gogh referred to it that way, uh, the place where he wrote some of his great novels, uh, with an emphasis especially on the, um, the chair, now poignantly vacated, of course, because Dickens has died. Um, these two images were certainly among the huge collection uh, that um, Van Gogh amassed. You know, he bought the graphic, I mentioned that, but he, he also cut uh, illustrations out of numerous uh, magazines and novels. Uh, there are 3,000 of them now uh, in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The collection's still intact, so we know uh, what Van Gogh had as his kind of um, reservoir of possible sources of visual inspiration. Mostly with the Brit British illustrations, he didn't uh, literally copy them. Um, he, his response to them was a bit more complex than that. In 1888, um, he painted these two chairs, um, which are portraits in the form of still lifes. You know, that's Van Gogh on the left and Gauguin on the right. Um, Van Gogh has the rustic looking chair, uh, simple pleasures on it, like uh, his, you know, the pipe and the tobacco. Um, the, the whole scene looks like it's bathed in nice outdoor light uh, coming in through the window, and then uh, um, some sprouting onions, you know, something earthy and simple like that. Uh, and then Gauguin, by, by contrast, in his still life as portrait, uh, has the more elegant, refined, sophisticated, and more expensive d chair design, you know. Um, it's nighttime here, there's a candle burning, and um, uh, books on the, on the chair. Now, the, the, the British connection, of course, is that um, Van Gogh got the idea from, the, uh, from his collection of English illustrations because, as you, I'm sure you've noticed, the, there's a prominent chair with a candle on it in the illustration to the Edwin Drood, um, which he picks up here in, with the Gauguin. And, of course, the whole idea of the, the poignant, meaningful empty chair in the... Um, the illustration of Dickens's studio as well. Um, more Dickens illustrations. Um, on the left, an illustration to uh, a new edition of uh, Martin Chuzzlewit, and then the right, um, an edition of Hard Times. It's interesting that, uh, by and large, Van Gogh didn't collect and respond to the original Dickens illustrators who were working with him in the 1830s and 40s, you know, way back um, uh, for the first editions of these famous novels. He quite liked um, the, the, the extra modernity, if you like, if you, that you got if you, if you collected and, and, and um, studied the, the more recent illustrators uh, in more recent editions. Uh, these are both, by the way, wood engraved by the D.L. brothers, uh, spelt, uh, it looks like Dalziel, but the most famous wood engravers in Britain at this time were a pair of brothers called uh, D.L., their last name. And you see their, their name in countless 
um, illustrations of novels and uh, magazines at this time. They were prolific. Um, what they, their, their role was to cut what the artist had, had drawn. Uh, the process was that the, the, the piece of boxwood would be covered in a, a layer of what was called Chinese white. Uh, the artist would just do a drawing in pen and ink on it, and then it was the job of the DLs or whatever wood engravers to cut into the surface to make it uh, a, pr a printing surface. Um, and I mention that because Van Gogh was interested in that technical side too. He went to all the trouble of visiting another famous wood engraver called Joseph Swain to put, get a full understanding of how it all worked. Um, so anyway, the, the, as you probably guessed by now, the, uh, I'm showing these because they, like the previous um, illustrations I showed you, played a part in the genesis of, a, of major works by, by Van Gogh himself. On the right here, a drawing called Worn Out. And by the way, that's not a translation. That is the, the way Van Gogh himself referred to this drawing um, using English. And that's a symptom of his, his love of um, uh, the English graphic world. Uh, and we know that um, actually he aspired as a young man to live in London permanently and work as a, as a wood engraver or as an illustrator. Um, it didn't work out, of course, but he definitely mentions his uh, hope that one day that could happen <laughs> in letters to Theo. And then that gets further transformed in this uh, late work. This is again from when he's in the hospital, the asylum in saint Remy. Um, uh, and, you know, which is the time that he painted the prison scene that he got from Gustave Doré. And again, uh, it's, there's, there's the, ele the elemental opposition of color um, makes meaning here in that um, the, the figure, the old man in anguish, uh, somehow blue just seems exactly right as the color for him. And it's intensified and exaggerated by the surrounding predominance of, of yellow. Um, so we, you see a kind of process of distillation and intensification from the original uh, storytelling illustration in, in the Dick, for the Dickens novels. Um, Van Gogh plucks out a significant figure of the, uh, the elderly man with his head in his, in his hands, um, plays up at the, 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 the whole idea of extreme tiredness, and then by, by this moment very late in his life um, brings the emotion to a higher pitch in an image of our old age and fear of death um, through the, his use of color. Now for a bit, I'd like to step back and look at um, the Anglo-Dutch relationship in a more general way for a moment. Because, you know, Britain and the Netherlands are very close together, actually, uh, geographically. They were rivals, um, especially in the 17th century, there were a series of Anglo-Dutch wars. Uh, but as far as art is concerned, they're very um, connected. Um, and the crucial thing that they had in common through, through the ages, really, from the 16th century onwards, was um, that they were both uh, Protestant countries. So whereas in Italy, with church patronage, um, the, the predominant form of art was really, was really religious, um, because of the traditional Protestant reluctance to enter into uh, anything that possibly might smack of idolatry, you know, that's a, a, a important principle of Protestantism as opposed to Roman Catholicism. So both, both the Netherlands and Britain um, produced mainly portraiture, genre painting, you know, everyday life painting, and landscape painting, not so much on the religious side. So you see in the realm of the genre painting, um, the, the great Dutch genre painters like Jan Steen were an inspiration for Britain's first homegrown uh, great artist, right, in my opinion, William Hogarth. You know, his scenes are very much based on the Dutch. And in landscape, um, both Thomas Gainsborough 
and in the 18th century, and John Constable in the 19th century, very rooted in, in Dutch landscape and very inspired by it. Now, it's no accident, actually, that both Gainsborough and Constable came from the part of England that's closest to the Netherlands, from, from East Anglia, where there were all kinds of ties, uh, artistic and non-artistic, between the two countries, two uh, areas. Anyway, what, what's especially relevant for Van Gogh, I think, is that in some landscapes in this, what you might call Anglo-Dutch landscape tradition, uh, there was an infusion of um, religious feeling. Um, it's as if, because there was little or no outlet for uh, religious feeling in, in actual re the painting of actual religious subjects, it, somehow it, some of it got displaced into the painting of landscapes. So with the Rembrandt, has, has re this famous Rembrandt etching here, just an example, as has often been observed, the three trees here, uh, for anyone um, uh, who's familiar with the, with the Christian tradition, which everyone was in Europe, of course, at this time, uh, they, they, they remind you of the three crosses, uh, Calvary. Um, in this Risedale paint, painting here, which uh, is actually a picture that um, Van Gogh knew very well because it was in the Moritz house in The Hague, um, you get this sense of maybe a beneficent divine presence illuminating the bleaching fields here, uh, and the whole scene presided over by the, the cathedral of Harlem here, St. Bavo's Cathedral. Just a, a hint of some kind of, you might say, latent religious content in a, a landscape. A thing which is a, a phenomenon that um, I think uh, reaches its almost most clear form in the work of Mondrian, you know, the great Dutch painter of the 20th century, who's, um, uh, who was devoted really to finding a type of art that was um, spiritual, the expression of spiritual meaning. Um, and he starts with landscape and moves from landscape into abstraction. Anyway, um, you get the same sort of thing in the work of uh, John Constable, too. And Constable's cornfield was available to Van Gogh because it was in the National Gallery in London, which he visited frequently. Um, Constable was a devout Christian. And even though there's nothing, uh, you know, it's not a scene from the Bible, obviously, but um, in, for a, for, through Christian eyes, sheep, sheep and shepherds, uh, there, there's such a recurrent motif in the, in the New Testament especially that they couldn't but um, spark some kind of religious resonance in the viewer. Um, you get a sense here almost of the stages of life where you, there's movement um, along the path here. The, here's the old shepherd here. The boy in the foreground, you know, it's as if you go from um, um, boyhood to older age. And then in the distance, I don't know if you can see it in this image, but there's a the Dedham Church, which occurs right in the middle of so many of Constable's compositions. So you get a sense of um, almost a pilgrimage, um, not in an ironic sense like with Doré, but a, or a, a progress through life to um, your reward, your heavenly reward almost. Um, so I don't want to overemphasize that, but it, it, it's something that I mentioned because I think um, this may be the way these landscapes looked, particularly through Van Gogh's eyes. Um, what differentiates Constable a little bit from the Dutch predecessors is maybe how personal it was. For, for him, uh, these scenes were associated with his own boyhood. When he, when he paints a boy like that, it's really him. He's like Wordsworth. He, he, be, he felt that the origins of his uh, sensitivity and his ability as an artist were rooted in, in his experiences as a child. Um, so this is his homeland, and he's in a way painting himself. I want to come back to that general idea in a minute. So anyway, given Van Gogh's... Um, state of attune, being attuned to religious content in, in paintings. I think it's not surprising that he found this picture 
which he saw at the Royal Academy of 1874, to be the most inspiring that he ever saw at a Royal Academy exhibition. He mentions it many times. Um, it's a scene of pilgrims in the Middle Ages heading to Canterbury Cathedral, the pilgrimage site best known through you know, the work of Chaucer. And this is meant to be sort of an illustration to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Well, not quite illustration, it's inspired by. You know, it's a, it is a, a, a pilgrim here who's saying maybe his farewells to a young woman here. And he's going to get on the path here that leads to um, Canterbury. Here's another prospective pilgrim, I guess, um, this um, monk on the right. So it's a landscape where um, the, the idea of distance, which landscape always expresses, of course, is um, a suggestion of moving towards a spiritual destination. I'm, I think that's what he liked about it. Interestingly, he kind of transformed this painting in his memory into something a bit different because he wrote about it in a letter uh, to Theo. And also, he got invited to give a sermon in London. You know, you remember I was saying he, he was, wanted to be a lay preacher, basically. And he, th they allowed him to talk at a Wesleyan Methodist church in 1876. And he used this painting as the basis for part of his sermon, which we still have. And he, rem but he describes it rather inaccurately, because he, he goes on about um, a holy city in the distance, which isn't really there. It's like a sort of glowing destination for, and there are other d details um, that um, show that he got mixed up a little bit between, or he, maybe that sounds too negative. He conflated this image with the idea of Pilgrim's Progress. You know, the great book by John Bunyan, um, maybe the first English novel, arguably, which is a kind of, um, um, kind of a, a theological novel about the Christian um, finding his way from what Bunyan calls the, the city of destruction. You might almost say like Babylon, like London, uh, to the celestial city, um, heaven or et eternity, through a series of kind of adventures that shine a light on uh, moral and religious truths. Um, anyway, so that's, that's certainly uh, how Van Gogh saw this. So he, he's changing a, a scene that sort of connected to Chaucer uh, into something more connected to that other text, the, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. So the, the, the concept of a landscape as somehow um, having more religious and moral feeling is not just Dutch and British, certainly not just Van Gogh's idea, um, but he, he saw it other places too, and he saw it especially in um, this wonderful painting by Mie that's in the exhibition, uh, the French painter. And his love of Mie is very well known. Um, um, you can't miss it because he made literal, literally made copies, you know, in his own um, supercharged coloristic fashion. He made, he made copies of um, uh, Mie compositions like, uh, like the Soa. Um, and I couldn't resist actually adding into the mix here um, an illustration by my artist, John Everett Millet very similar names. It's very curious that Van Gogh's favorite British artist was Millet, and one of his favorite French artists was Millet, because actually they were very, very, very distantly related. <laughs> the, um, the English Millet came from a, a family in the Channel Islands, which is actually closer to northern France than it is to England. And um, it's close to the actual part of northern France that the French painter Mie came from, and the families were sort of, sort of connected. Um, in any case, Van Gogh must surely have known and admired Millet's Parables um, book. Uh, it was published in 1863. Uh, 
this, and this is a page from it showing a sower, obviously, here. Um, and I, I suppose what I want to illustrate here is the way that sowers could be implicitly religious and reminiscent of um, the great Jesus' great parable of the sower who's, who's sowing the seeds of the Christian message, really, some of which fall on stony ground and some of which fall on fertile ground, etc., etc. So that's, it's implicit here and explicit in the Millet because the, his book is all is a series of illustrations to the parables. And I, I just can't but imagine that um, uh, Van Gogh would have loved the the kind of con connection that you see here, and that both Millets, Mie and Millet, both played some part in the inspiration from, for his fa fabulous treatments of uh, the Soa theme, which he pursued through various different um, paintings. So to, to Millet, John Everett Millet, uh, he was, as I've mentioned, the preeminent British painter of, of the day. So it's not surprising that Van Gogh uh, noticed and ad admired him. Um, he met him in the street once, and it was for Van Gogh, it was like meeting an incredible, overpowering celebrity. <laughs> he was kind of nervous about it. Uh, it's quite comical to think of it that way now when you think of their reputations today. But uh, um, definitely, Millet was the famous name. Uh, and the, you know, he's the the predominant presence in British art. And Van Gogh mentions him no less than 17 times in the letters to Theo and other friends, um, and including several references to this particular painting by Millet, which Van Gogh saw when it came up for sale at a Christie's auction in 1875, and he was wowed by it. Um, Millet, by the way, was uh, was not just famous in England, but he was quite well known and admired in Europe. Um, Chill October, for example, um, was shown at the 1878 World's Fair in Paris, you know, the one where they built the Eiffel Tower. Um, and um, generally, his work found its way across the channel, you know, um, on many occasions and was much uh, praised by the, the, the French critics. Van Gogh actually tells a story um, about his relative, Anton Mauve, who was a Hague School landscape painter who was married to Van Gogh's cousin. Anyway, he was, he was a bit annoyed with Mauve because he, he was slow to get the message about Millet, but um, was rather um, impressed with Millet's Chill October, especially when he saw it in Paris in 1878. Um, Millet, in, in paintings like the, this painting and other uh, large-scale landscapes, was, was responding in a way to Constable. Constable had done a series of six-footers, as he called them, um, very big, ambitious uh, landscapes. And, and Millet's Chill October is almost exactly six foot two. Um, but uh, it's, it's unlike a Constable in its kind of bleakness. There's something very welcoming and homey about Constable's work that um, uh, Millet is contradicting in an almost willful way here. For most people at the time, used to the romantic type landscape of Constable, um, Millet would have seemed just um, like anti-picturesque, like he's chosen a place that's um, deliberately not very appealing. And it, it, it wasn't in a way because he's, he, he actually painted this all outdoors, by the way, painted it on the spot. Um, with, um, and he had a, a, a railroad track just behind him as he was working with his easel that where trains would hurtle by every now and then. It was, so it, it, was, uh, it took a lot of, um, uh, it was a brave undertaking actually and something quite new that attracted a lot of attention. Uh, it, so it's big, it's a surprisingly ordinary scene and it, it's got a melancholy bleakness about it too. Um, Millet seems to have had a, a special attraction to the season of autumn um, and uh, had uh, indeed painted one of his greatest works. Called, it's called Autumn Leaves. 
um, in the 1850s before this, uh, which shows some, some young, uh, some girls building a bonfire at sunset. And it's very suggestive of the idea that all things must pass, you know, very rooted in the poetry of Tennyson, actually. Tennyson's, one of Tennyson's favorite images was autumn as the season of, of um, transience and mortality. Very different from the Mediterranean concept of autumn as being abundance and you know it's the, the grape harvest and all that. In Britain, uh, for British poets, Tennyson and for British artists like Millet, autumn is very much the, uh, uh, the, the, the season that makes you think about things coming to an end. Um, and it, it was a very, it was a personal place, this. It was painted in, in Perth, in Scotland. Um, that's where the railway trains were going as they sped back and forth behind Millet as he painted it. And Perth meant a lot to Millet because his wife was from Perth and he spent a lot of time there, uh, actually lived there for a few years and uh, spent time with her family. So it's a bit like Constable in that way, very personal. And I, I can't but think that... Um, Somehow the bleakness is to do with the fact that he turned 40 years old in this, just before he painted this. I know it doesn't sound very old <laughs> now, but uh, there was something about that, I think. So I hope you can just about read this, um, this quote here, because um, can you read that, or is it a bit too, a bit too small? Because <laughs> I wanted to... Um, bring together a couple of things I've been talking about because, because they come together in this quote from, from Van Gogh in one of his letters to Theo, uh, where he refers to the Risedale painting, the Dutch 17th century painting that we've talked about, and to the Millet, and um, compares the two. What he says is that the Risedale, maybe it's sublime, Rembrandt and Risedale are both you know, he says, what, as regards the difference between old and contemporary art, perhaps the new artists are deeper thinkers. There's another great difference in sentiment between Chill October by Millet and the Overain Bleaching Grounds by Risedale, for example. Rembrandt and Risedale are sublime for us as much as for their contemporaries, but there's something in the moderns that strikes us as more personally intimate. Um, so Millet is more, more personal. I, I suppose he's talking about the kind of ways that I was trying to explain just now. Um, perhaps Millet, you could say, compared with the old master landscape painter there, is a bit more original because, he's, he's, because of his anti-picturesque stance. Um, but perhaps most of all for, for Van Gogh, more moody. You know, autumn, as Van Gogh says in another letter, Autumn is very, very much seems like the modern season. <laughs> because, and I think what he meant by that is because of all the seasons, it's the one with the strongest mood. And for him, modern art uh, was going to be about the expression of the strongest possible moods and emotions. So autumn appealed for him, even early on, even before he becomes a painter, for that reason. So I, I'm not trying to say that... Um, the Millet painting was kind of a source for Van Gogh that he imitated in later life. Um, it, it's more that there was a common underlying attitude to landscape uh, as a ve vehicle for personal feeling um, that he took forward. So my final slide, just looking at Van Gogh, this is like a kind of scrapbook of um, visual memories that Van Gogh brought with him from London. And you, you see immediately that there's an overall kind of dark tone. And uh, as we all know, his style was transformed later by um, the revelation of color that he found in French Impressionist painting and, and Japanese woodblock prints too. Um, so it, I think his experience of British art in those formative years that he lived there, in a way before he became Van Gogh, was um, that it left him with a certain philosophy of art. Um, you remember that quote near the beginning when I had the photo of him, where he says Br British art is high and noble. 
It's funny in a way that Van Gogh would become the hero of, uh, of modern art that he is now, but um, curious that he admired Victorian art so much, which is so often presented as the opposite of modern. Um, in the early 20th century, critics like Roger Fry in Britain um, decried the Victorians for their dependence on realism and storytelling and sentiment. They, they, the, the, the modern zealots of the early 20th century who embraced Van Gogh so enthusiastically, they did it uh, as a way of, you know, partly as, as kicking against the Victorians. Um, art needed to be um, saved from this kind of thing. Art was about aesthetic emotion, uh, form and color, not the, not the conveying of human things like the personal, personality or, or about literary things or sentimental things. And so this point of view was very influential and in a way uh, very good for art, but I think we should be really grateful to Van Gogh for his sheer open-mindedness about Victorian art, especially, and it's, it's refreshing to see Victorian art through his eyes. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. If there's a if there's a question or two, I'd be very. Um, I, uh, yes and no. I'd say it, it, it was common for artists to um, have visual reference material in their studios, but for him, the sheer bulk of it was very unusual. You know, that nobody, nobody had 3,000 of them. And he, he laboriously stuck them on nice pieces of paper too. He didn't just sort of have them lying around higgledy-piggledy kind of thing. He, he, he wanted to preserve them properly, almost like he was creating his own little museum. So that, I, I think that, that was unusual. Yeah. No, okay, well. I think I said everything that could be said <laughs> you've, you've, about you've that got, subject. Right, you're, it was comprehensive <laughs> and definitive, so there are no questions. Um, no, but it was very, very enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, um, thank you very much. And hopefully Malcolm will come back and speak with us um, again, but I do think that so much of what he said is so consonant with what we've presented in the exhibition, so hopefully when you go and see the exhibition again, you'll pick up on all these themes that, that Malcolm has uh, highlighted for us. But thank you so much for your attention, and enjoy your evening. Enjoy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Percolate. I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, were they aware? Were the other artists aware that he was thinking of them in this way and then communicating with them? Well, I think the English Millet probably didn't have any awareness of Van Gogh at all. In fact, he would have thought of him as a bit of a crackpot, probably, <laughs> um, if he'd, you know, uh, if he'd known him. I don't know about, but do you think Mie had any, uh, uh, no, he, he, he probably wasn't even around, was he? When, no, no so, so the, the French Mie uh, died too soon to, um, to realize that there was this strange Dutch artist making copies of his work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so generally you have to, it's hard for us to remember because he's, got cult status in our culture right now, but during Van Gogh's lifetime, he was completely obscure. Nobody really knew about his art, and it was only at the very, very end that he started getting exhibition attention uh, because there was a particular critic named Aurier, who was a symbolist, who wrote very favorably about Vincent at the very, very end of his life. And um, predictably, Vincent couldn't take 
this compliment and instead wrote back to him and said, look, it's really nice for you to say all these things to me, but it's not about me. It's all the other artists who came before me. And he talked about Millet, for example, or Daubigny. And he kept on saying, they're the ones who already did it, and I'm just trying to do my best to follow them. But really, his posthumous fame is what has made him so completely familiar. Other artists in Europe, with the exception of his friends from the Petit Boulevard in Paris, Gauguin, etc., they knew of his art. But it was a very small coterie of people, relatively speaking. So as Malcolm said, I guess he had the, the good fortune of running into yeah. Millet on the street and shaking his hand, but he wasn't friends, no. Um, and at that point, he was so awkward in general that he had a lot of difficulty actually approaching artists and telling them that he admired them. There's a story about him actually traveling to see um, Jules Breton making the, the trip on on foot and being too chicken to actually seek him out and, and say, hi, I really admire you and I really want to follow in your footsteps. But, you know, this is sort of the eternal problem for Vincent, who was extremely socially uh, challenged, let's just say. Uh, <laughs> For me, oh, um, I just say Van Gogh for comprehensibility. I mean, I, and because I find it quite hard to say Van Gogh, because I think that <laughs> yeah, is that precisely kind yeah. of what it would be. Yeah, that's pretty close to it. When um, our our colleague from um, Amsterdam was here for the symposium, and he was able, to, obviously, to pronounce it correctly. Um, I don't think any of us uh, otherwise could could pronounce it correctly. I choose to say Van Gogh because it's easier, and that's the French pronunciation. And he spent so much time in France; it's just easier. Um, partially, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, you know, all th all three are acceptable. Um, so it's a kind of a, kind of a compliment to someone when when their name becomes anglicized. I think in a way, in a funny way, right? Because uh, no, we we in when we're speaking English, we don't say Paris, you see, or Roma. We say Paris and Rome because they're they're incredibly important places that have their own English names, and in a way, so does so does Van Gogh now. Yeah, and we did have this debate uh, during the Symposium and Scholars Day also about Mie. I've always said Mie, but according to some specialists, his name should be pronounced Mille. Yeah, yeah. so, so it, it, you know, we, 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 we all go back and forth on these things. But um, anyway, I think that's probably, you're welcome, <laughs> and, and thank you again for coming, and uh, we'll thank see you. you again soon. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought I thought about that beforehand. <laughs>